Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. Friday night, and you're listening to Paranormal Review Radio with your host, Anthony Agati in New York. And Lucy Liebfried from Chicago. We have a great show tonight, and we're all glad that you were able to listen in. So, Lucy, why don't you start and tell everyone how they can participate tonight? Okay. Well, as always, our phone lines are open, so give us a call. The number to call in is 661 244 9831. If you wish to talk to us, Press the number 1 after calling the number. Now, if you wish just to listen to the show on your phone, stay on the line. We have our chat room up and running, so feel free to ask us a question or stir up a debate in the room. You can also send us an email at paranormalreviewradio at yahoo.com. And, of course, check us out on Facebook. On a quiet residential street in the small town sits an old white frame house. On a dark evening, the absence of lights and sounds are the first indication to visitors that this house is different from the other homes that surround it. Upon closer inspection, you'll notice her doors and windows are tightly closed and covered. An outhouse in the backyard suggests that this house does not occupy a place in the 21st century, but somehow belongs in another era or another story. A weather-beaten sign warns, rather welcomes, This is the Villisca Axe Murder House of Villisca, Iowa. Many paranormal groups and other inquisitive guests have entered this home in search for spirits and evil. Some have left screaming and some have left with an increased sense of the afterlife. But there is only one who has made this house his home away from home. I'm talking about Johnny Hauser. Johnny is a current caretaker and tour guide and has done so since about 2008-2009. Johnny is also a member of Everyday Paranormal Group that was founded by Brad and Barry Kling, or as some of you may know from the show Ghost Lab. Johnny has been featured on the Ghost Adventures episode during the filming of the Valeska House investigation. Johnny is also a dedicated and brilliant filmmaker and embraces the paranormal world with open arms. We are excited to have Johnny on the show, so help me in welcoming Mr. Johnny Hauser to the show. Hey Johnny, how are you? I'm good, how are you guys doing? Great. Johnny, well, welcome to the show. Um, we are just so excited to have you here. Um, you know, I just want to get started. Um, I had learned that you had visited the Valeska House as part of a Troy Taylor event. And from there, you became attracted to the home and the stories. So what was it about this house that made you stick around and continue on as part of the Valeska House history? Um, yeah, the the first real overnight that I ever did was with Troy Taylor uh, and he was doing that web series called Cringe and I was part of that. In fact, you can still find it online and see me hidden in the corner, you know, just kind of <laughs> soaking it all in, but it really dates a lot farther back from that. Um, the school I went to around 6th, 7th grade, I found a newspaper article about, you know, what happened. There's like a reprint and from there, I found a book called Morning Ran Red, which is purely fiction, but loosely based on the what happened. Uh, and then I kind of forgot about it. Um, when I came to Villisca, you know, I met my wife. We got married. Uh, she was from Des Moines. And I was showing her, you know, pictures. My mom has all these photo albums from, like, the 80s on up. And I showed her how dumb I looked back when I was a kid. And I was flipping through, and I found a picture of the house. And I said, Mom, what's the deal with this? You know, why do I have, why is there a picture of the axe murder house in here? And she looked at the back. She goes, oh, yeah, you're about 11 or 12 and insisted that we drive 
mind so you can take a picture of it. So then I end up down here, um, did the Troy Taylor thing, and I just start bugging Darwin, the owner, yeah, about every day. I'd go walk by and I'd just sit and stare at it. Finally, he had me start doing some tours, and then the house next door, Mary Peckham's house, opened up, and I moved in it, and here I am, I guess. So do you feel that you were meant to be part of this house? I mean, uh, do you think you were destined to go to that first event and then just everything fall into place? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, you know, my my wife's great-grandpa was Vest Cooney, the guy that cleaned up the mess, so to speak, day of the funeral. Mm-hmm. Um my best friend since fifth grade, his mom is Rosalind Jane Moore, a direct descendant. You know, it's just, and I didn't know any of this until about a year ago. It all just came into place. So for whatever reason, I have no idea. Yeah, I think I'm, you know, it's meant for me to be here right now. The fact that I mm-hmm. become best friends with a 77-year-old man, which was Darwin, that owned the place. I mean, it just all fell together. You know what? I have to know. What is it like living directly next to this house? Uh, it, it's something I have to kind of step back every now and then and uh, just kind of soak it in, you know. Um, just pulling in my driveway today, I noticed, you know, there's only one little strip of land which contains the Axe Murder House and my house, both the uh, and I see all these episodes of the most terrifying place in America, and most horrific haunting in America, and I'm like 10 feet from the place. Um, mm. which, but my life is far from normal. You know, I've, I deal with my house as just as haunted as the Axe Murder House. Um, so it, it's living it day by day. If I lived in a normal house and had a normal job, I think I'd go insane. <laughs> <laughs> the, the only thing that gets a little old are the uh, the tourists that think they can come stare in my windows. <laughs> mm. Oh, God. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. It, it, it was my little slice of pie for a long time, and I'm, I'm so glad people are taking an interest in it, but it's almost becoming you know, like the next Amityville house. Like, it's just so notorious that there's traffic nonstop. Mm. Well, you know what, Johnny, I'm sure most of our listeners know the gruesome history and the reason why this house is so haunted. But can you just share with our listeners what happened on June 10th, 1912? Yeah, uh, the night of the ninth, the, the Moore family, which was a family of six, Uh, came home with Ina and Lena Stillinger, who were 8 and 11. And they were just friends having a sleepover. Uh, The next day is when Mary Peckham, the neighbor of the house that I live in, noticed that nobody was up doing any chores. Uh, She tried tapping on the windows, couldn't get an answer. Finally, she got a relative down who used a skeleton key, walked into the first bedroom downstairs, and that's where he found Ina and Lena. Had no idea who it was. Uh, he didn't go upstairs. He ran out. They got the cops. They went upstairs, found six more bodies. There was eight total. Um, every mirror was covered. The axe was left in the house. There was uh, food at the table where he'd made himself something to eat afterwards. Uh, oil lamps were at the edge of the beds. Tops removed. A slab of bacon, raw slab of bacon left in one of the rooms. And all kinds of weird things. Within moments, you know, 20, 30 minutes, the town was bombarded with over 200 townspeople, and they just wiped up the entire scene. In fact, by the time any detectives got up here, the only one, the first one they phoned came from Kansas City, and he was so drunk when he got off the train, they had to sober him up at the motel first, so yeah, that's obvious why it was never solved. Johnny, in your mind, can can you explain why you think the spirits of the Moore family and the two girls, uh, Lena and Ina, still haunt the home? Um, yeah, you kind of have your classic case for a haunting, you know. Uh, you got six pe- oh, eight people killed, all in bed, all while sleeping, six of them kids. Killer was never found. It's still unsolved. I mean, there's just so many different theory and we really don't know 
why ghosts stay around, but the thought of unfinished business is one, and not being able to rest till the killer's found, or, you know, being killed in bed, just not even knowing they're dead. Hmm. Now, I also learned, and I may have my facts wrong, but, um, there was a, a family that actually lived in the home for many years, um, um, and I had heard that they, they did not experience any paranormal activity. Is is that true? Yep. Yeah, there was a, a family that lived there about 20-some years and claimed nothing strange at all happened. Um, but it, dating back to 1918 was the very first person that lived in the house after the murders. They actually offered six months free rent for anyone who would live there. Uh, John Giesman moved in. He stayed one night, slept in the barn the rest of the time, and just said there's something not right with this house. Uh, 1925, Homer Rittner and his wife stayed two nights. They left. And, of course, the Cloud Sisters in the 60s, they left. So, you know, the family in the 80s was the only family that's lived there and experienced nothing, which, you know, they very well could have had nothing happen. Um, but I know from growing up in one of the houses that I lived in as a kid that were haunted, we had pocket doors that would open into the wall, and those would open and slam, and my mom would say, ah, it's the wind, which mm. there's no wind in the world that's going to blow through walls and slide a sliding door on a track, you know. But skeptics will be skeptics and just kind of disprove anything. But, you know, they're, it could have been completely dormant. When uh, Darwin bought the place, his, he had no intentions of hauntings or ghosts. It was purely a historical place. And they were going to bulldoze it, so that's why he bought it. And he bought it, he ripped out all the new stuff that they had in it, all the carpeting, the siding, the electricity, put all the stuff back exactly where it sat, down to covering the mirrors. And I think what he was doing from a paranormal st standpoint is, you know, talk about trigger objects. Uh, if this house was dormant, you know, adding a huge spark to light it up again. Then throw in thousands and thousands of people investigating seven nights a week. It's bound to stir up stuff. Now, now you mentioned Darwin. Do, do you know why he bought the house? Yeah, uh, he was just, he had the museum in town. 100% history buff. He didn't even believe in ghosts, he wanted, didn't even think of ghosts. I mean, growing up, he always said that he was forbidden to celebrate Halloween because that was the dark side. You know, and this is middle America, Iowa, where there's a lot of superstition and traditions and things like that. Um, th they were going to bulldoze it because nobody would buy the place. Nobody would rent it. And it sat empty for years and years. So he drove by, he Finally, he thought, well, I'm just going to put a bid. You know, this is a huge piece of Iowa history. And he didn't hear anything for a few months, and finally they said, well, you got the place. You're the only one that bid. So that's that's kind of where it all started, and it took him a long, long time before he even allowed people to stay the night. They couldn't figure out why anyone would want to stay the night. Had, had he actually... Um witnessed any paranormal activity and maybe that was the reason why he sort of changed? Yeah, uh, once he started talking to people in the paranormal field, he started realizing that some of the things he's had happen was paranormal. He said, you know, he always told me, John, I I don't, I didn't know what to look for or what any, I didn't even know what paranormal was. He goes, but I remember being in there in August and seeing my breath you know, in the room getting real cold, and I thought, oh, that's strange. He goes, but I never equated it to ghosts. I didn't have any idea that's what that could symbolize, you know. And he would always hear kids or footsteps or tugs on his pants, thing like that. But, you know, he just didn't even think twice about it. Now, you mentioned that there were um, haunted claims shortly after the um, the murders in 1912 by people entering and, and uh, living in the home for a short period of time. But what are some of the most horrifying paranormal claims that uh, have been reported in the house since uh, since you've been there? Uh, there's been quite a few scratchings, uh, some pushings. Uh, one lady was kind of attacked in the attic. Um, 
um, you know, and that's just kind of recently started over the last few three years or so. I've seen it take a drastic turn. Um, one of the, you know, one of the best stories I, I can tell about the scratchings is it was about 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, and I had a retired min- or a retired history teacher and a minister come in for a tour. And they spent about 10 minutes lecturing me on don't insult my intelligence with ghost stories and blah, blah, blah. So I just said, yeah, it's, I'll just do the straight history. That's no big deal. So uh, we end up in the kids' room, and the minister said, can I look in the attic or the kids' room closet? I said, yeah, go ahead. She opened the door and kind of peeked around, and she fell back two or three feet, and she started tearing up. She goes, you know, it felt like a hand took my head and pushed me. And her friend's going, oh, come on, you're losing it, you know. And right then she kind of screamed and grabbed her back, lifted her shirt, and there's, of course, the three huge scratch marks completely across her back. And, I mean, they ran out of there bawling instantly. She actually came back about a year later to talk to me about the experience, and she was still shook up. She still didn't know what to make of it. And that started a spree of about 25, 30 scratchings, within a few month period and then it just stopped. Wow. Has, has anyone ever tried to come into the home maybe, you know, uh, of the clergy or some mystical group that has tried to sort of help the spirits move on to the afterlife? Oh yeah, you know, and I I don't want anybody, any kids or anybody being trapped there, you know. I, I don't want that right. at all. And so I have invited every possible religious faith you can imagine. If you can come down and cleanse this house and help them move on, have at it. And you have literally probably been about 300 pounds of sage burned in that place. And hmm. I've had Catholic priests hose it down with holy water, you name it. Doesn't do a thing. You know, the, the ceilings are li- literally black from the sage smoke. Nothing. Hmm. It, it, it may be quiet for, you know, a day but it just comes back ten times as bad. Well, you know what, Johnny? Whenever Anthony and I, when we discuss haunted locations or, you know, we're going to investigate a paranormal location, it always seems to go back to Native American grounds. Now, I'm part Cherokee, and I've always tried to research places with the Native American background in mind. And... I learned during the research that Valeska was actually called Valeska by the native uh, Indian fox tribe. And from what I've found, that they knew the land of Valeska was evil, and they never set a home on the land because of it. So can you share with us what you know about this? And and do you feel it may have something to do with the hauntings today and and the spirits that aren't at rest? Oh, yeah, and that's... 100% 100% true. The, the Sack and Fox uh, had this land, of course, way before any of us were here. And uh, They named this area Waliska, which literally translates to evil spirit. Uh, and they would also bury their insane and hated face down in shallow graves so they'd be you know, doomed to forever walk the earth and not pass over. And throughout the years, it turned into Waliska, which Google Waliska, there's no meaning for it. There's no town in the entire world called Beliska, but this one because it's Waliska. Um, and I, I took, you know, June 1901, just as a random date, and started going through the microfish at the library to see if there's any other strange murders. I found about 20 in about a two-month period. Um, and I didn't count, like, hit by train or struck by lightning, you know, that kind of stuff happened more often than it should have, but guy killed his wife, stabbed her to death in the town square. Uh, there's been three people shot outside of stores in the town square. Um, a woman uh, slid her own throat to die. A woman burnt to death while quil- quilting. You know, how does that happen? Oh, uh, so this, yeah. It just goes wow. on and on and on. And, like, the, that, the more thing is the most popular. But there's a ton of other weird stuff. In fact... I, I printed out a bunch of these because I knew nobody would believe this. But there was a Honeyman drugstore in town. And if you come to Villisca and have time, go to the library and look in the microfish machines. 
when you start going through the papers in the early 1900s on up to about 1940, this Honeyman drugstore made its own cold elixir. And it's for a runny nose, sore throat, blah, blah, blah. And I kid you not, the name of it was 666. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Which, oh you know, it, I, I seen that and I thought, no way, no way possible. But yeah, it's right there in the paper. You can print out and take time. I'd love to find a bottle of it. But so basically, I, this is the oh, whole town. I'm sorry. It's the whole town that that is basically affected by this, correct? I think so. Um, you know, nobody in town will ever talk about it, but I'm kind of the weird ghost hunting guy in town. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, every once in a while I'll get old, older women coming up to me and saying, well, my house is haunted, I'm hearing voices and this and that, but don't tell anyone, you know, things like that. But yeah, this well, is like what? a Twilight Zone land. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you mentioned like the the uh, you know older women coming up to you and talk. Basically, what does the whole town of Valeska think about having this haunted location and having all the tourists coming through? Um, you know, at first there was a lot of opposition, which I'm not from this town at all, but I can see, you know. Um, and now they're they're realizing it's not like a, a circus sideshow. It's you come take a tour. It's just the house as it was, and you learn all about the history. And you know, with bad history comes ghost stories. Go to Gettysburg, see if you can find a Civil War story. It's all ghost stories. You know, it's just the name of the right. game. Um, and they're finally seeing in a town that has nothing at all, you know, we bring right around a thousand day tours a month, not even counting the overnights, all the TV shows we have on our, you know, they have to do their catering in town and stuff. So we're probably the biggest business in Villisca, you know, and I've had a lot of store owners say, thank you because we wouldn't be able to stay open if it wasn't for you guys. Hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of the younger kids and stuff, you'd be surprised at how many people watch, like, Ghost Adventures, you know. <laughs> I've had a lot of people that were complete skeptics and used to make comments to me every day after the Ghost Adventures aired. They're like, oh, yeah, oh, I knew that, you know. <laughs> so have you ever spoke to or come across other family members of the Moors or the Stillingers and ask them what they think of the home and the hauntings? Yeah, I've actually done tours in the home to Stillingers and Moors. And, you know, they all kind of knew that that what, what happened, but they didn't know all the little details. So, you know, I've, I've had Stillingers and Moors shake my hand and say, thank you for doing this for my family. That's all I need. Mm-hmm. So what does your family think about your involvement in the paranormal and with Valeska? Um, <laughs> knowing me, for, yeah, I, I've lived in six haunted houses. Uh, my very first job was a grave digger at a cemetery when I was 16. I mean, it's no surprise <laughs> to anybody in my family. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, my parents thought I would be a uh, a uh, a mortician, you know, the embalming and autopsies and stuff. They thought that's what I would turn into, but, you know, they're not surprised. And my dad is a big Ghost Lab fan, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, J Johnny, you had mentioned before that, um, you know, there's sort of an increase in the activity, and you mentioned the scratches. Um, but I know, you know, some locations or, or – some um, owners of, of haunted locations and um, tourist guides have, have mentioned that, um, and I think it's been in recent years, that they've noticed different types of hauntings or um, maybe where maybe they never heard scratches before. Oh, I think we lost Johnny. Did mm -hmm. we lose him, Lucy? I think we did. 
Let's see. Let me dial him up again. All right. See if we can get him on the line again. Probably those damn spirits getting him. Please enjoy this ringback tone while the U.S. cellular ah, customer is, is reached. And I wear. <laughs> we lost him again. Number. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. Oh boy. Please enjoy this ringback tone while the U.S. cellular customer is reached. Hello. Hello. Hey, Johnny. <laughs> that was kind of odd. <laughs> <laughs> we thought maybe some of the uh, spirits may have hung up the phone and you didn't want you to speak. Yeah, it's so also an additional tone on my end. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so what I was trying to say before was, you know, some um, owners of haunted locations say that um, they're starting to sort of experience different types of um, voices or even spirits themselves, like different names of spirits are coming through or possibly maybe, you know, footsteps where they may never heard footsteps before. Are, are you finding that in the Velisca home? Is there anything new that's sort of odd and different than um, any of the other experiences that have sort of happened before? Oh, yeah, and that's kind of cool you mentioned that. Um, but there's been, like, EVPs in French, you know, which has nothing wow. to do with anything. Um a lot of just random things, you know, random names that have nothing to do with anything. Um, a lot of a lot of stuff like that's been coming out, you know, since a lot of the TV shows have been there, which, you know, I don't know if, like, stuff attached to all those guys or, you know, maybe right. these, you know, popular places are almost like beacons of light to lost spirits just roaming around and, they're just, you know, you say you're a ghost and you hear of this place where people come every night to try and communicate with you and you really got a message you want to give somebody, you would probably go straight for that place. Mm -hmm. So it, it's hard to tell, but that's interesting. If the town of Aliska said that the home needs to be shut down, what would you say or what would you do? You know, I mean, if you were... If you were told to give up Velisca Axe Murder House and move on, would you? Um, well, it, the town, yeah, we kind of went through that for years and years, which the house is privately owned, you know. Actually, it's private property. It's a Darwin's home. So, right. Yeah, and now it's on a state historical society, you know, but if it... You know, if I had to leave, would I leave? Yeah, I'm not going to be forced out of anywhere until I'm ready to go, you know. So, I mean, it, it is a part of you. I mean, the, the home is a part of you. I, I've heard this so many times from folks who, um, you know, work or own um, or or um, really attached with a haunted location that it's very hard, hard to give up. You know, it almost becomes a part of you, a part of your family, and a part of your life. And so for someone to sort of come in and say, okay, you know, you know you've got to move now to another state and do something else uh, in your life, um, it, it, it's almost as if you're, you're parting with a family member, you know, or, or a family member or friend has just died. It, it's just very difficult. And I kind of get that from you in, in the way that you're speaking. Yeah, and I never really thought about it, but, yeah, and it, it, with this place, it's kind of freaky. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I've sat in that place. I've been here for five, six years. I've sat in there alone you know, count over 200 nights, you know. Just, I, I walk, it's getting to, I walk into the place and I'll talk to it, you know. It's, mm. Uh, after a it while, doesn't I doesn't sound strange. It, it, it doesn't sound strange to me, Johnny. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, if there's there's overnights there that are kind of being rude, I'll go in and all right, really give it to these guys, you know. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, that's kind of scary to think about. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll move on. We'll move on. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> Do, do you feel that the house will 
<clears throat> ever be free of the presence that's there? Uh, not as long as people are going in and, you know, you, you can, let's say you cleanse the house and you close those doors, you know, who's to say the moors are even there anymore? You know, they could be hmm. gone. It could just be something completely different. Yeah, and you could do everything to close that door and there's nothing there, but, you know, the moment somebody walks in and says, you know, can you give me a sign of your presence? Is anyone here? It's opened right back up. I think it's just... Right. One of my friends, Roland Signs, said it best. He goes, that place is just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse till it just, like, sinks into the ground, poltergeist style, you know? Mm. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's just like what you just said. You know, the more and more investigators go there and, you know, television shows and such... Um, and, you know, these folks could have things attached to them, bring them there, and then these spirits stay. So it's sort of, you know, the house can morph and morph and morph. Um, and, you know, the moors may not be there anymore, and it's just brought in other stuff. And, uh, you know, the, the house could be full of where it originally was eight people. You know, now it could be at 30. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, um, I, I did want to say... I, Johnny, I did want to say congratulations on becoming part of the uh, Kling Brothers group, Everyday Paranormal. Um, Lucy and I have been privileged to actually um, go on an investigation with them, and they are awesome guys. Uh, how is that going, and, and what can we expect from the group in the future? Um, we, uh, yeah, we did uh, probably six episodes of the six or more episodes of the Dead Truth, which um, are still being edited right now. Um, and actually, uh, this last week, Brad and Barry just kind of decided to retire 100% from the field, you know, and just pursue mm -hmm. other things and handed the dead truth and all of everyday paranormal over to me. So that's great. Congratulations. Yeah, well, it, you know, it's kind of bittersweet. I, I see their position 100%. Yeah. They've been doing this since like 1990 you know they've been all over the country they've had their own show they've investigated Alcatraz you know I mean just hmm. they feel in their minds it's time to move on to the next venture which I was sad you know I love those guys to death had a blast with them but you know they said we want you to continue the dead truth I was like yeah that's fine they go, well, we want to just hand everyday paranormal over to you. It's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know what to say. It's like, wow. <laughs> you know, this is amazing, but at the same time, everyday paranormal to me is Brad and Barry, you know. Right. Right. So, and who who, who, who said, are the other members in the, in the group with you? Uh, right now, it's uh, Roland Signs. And Kathy Cash, which is Johnny Cash's daughter. And Kathy was with the Dead Truth, you know, with Brad and Barry. Uh, and then, you know, right. like all the old Mitkos Lab members will forever be everyday paranormal. But they're just mm -hmm. kind of off doing their own thing. So the active members right now are just me, Kathy, and Ro. Um, and I, I, I thought about it for a while. And, you know, Brad said, if, if you don't carry this on, it's just done forever. I thought, well, right. you guys did so much work and so many different advancements in the field and things like that, you know, just to let this legacy die is a mistake. Absolutely, I'll carry it on. And say six months from now, a year from now, ten years from now, you say, hey, you know, we want to do this ghost stuff again. Here it is. It's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, so. Johnny, I think it's absolutely awesome. And and I know Roland and he is absolutely cool. I just think it's it's such an awesome opportunity for you. And of course, we're going to miss Brad and Barry, but you know what what they've done just started the whole thing for you and I am we're so confident that you're just going to carry it through and it's just going to continue and it's just going to be awesome. You know. Well, I, definitely. I, I appreciate it and I I'm just so floored that Brad and Barry thought that highly of me to hand over their baby. I mean, they're, this is everyday paranormal. Their group 
to me, you know, and to trust me with it was just still floors me. I, I told my wife today, it's like, how, how did this all happen? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> when I first started into this, I emailed every group I could find within a three-state area, and I got zero replies back. <laughs> and I was like, you know, hey, I'm really wanting to get into this. Can I, you know, come meet you guys? Can I talk to you? Can I ask you questions? Can I come along on an investigation? I'll, I'll roll cables. I'll stay out of the way. You know, not even a no, just nothing. So I thought, um, screw this. I'm just going to do it myself. And then mm. to have everyday paranormal handed over to me was kind of like, wow, you know. Well, Pretty, everything happens for a reason. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, Jenny, can you tell our listeners where they can go to learn more about the house? And also, if they want to schedule a date to go and investigate the Veleska Axe Murder House. Yeah, if you uh, go to www.veleskaiowa.com or just get on Google and type Veleska Axe Murders. We're the first page that pops up, and you can get on the calendar and see how to book your overnight and how to do day tours and things like that, which we're open uh, Tuesday through Sunday, 1 to 4, um, for walk-through tours. And, and, and a lot of stuff happens during the day. I mean, our daytime tours are filled with people sitting in rooms, rolling balls, and trying to get doors to open and close, and yeah, it's a pretty fun environment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? Um, what type of equipment have you found to be the best while investigating at Valeska? Uh, digital recorder is a must. <laughs> the place is 90% EVPs. Um, uh, definitely any DVR or any night vision, like handy cams or anything. The doors open and close quite often, <laughs> but EVPs, I mean, are the main. Anymore, when I go on investigations, I have like three pieces of equipment I take with me anyway. You know, I, I kind of, I, I had that phase where I had every possible thing you could ever imagine, and I found myself going into haunted locations, not worried more about, you know, the metal batteries and my mail meter and this and that. I'm like, you know, I probably missed 30 shadow figures walking right in front of me because I'm mm. carrying all this stuff and I have no idea what's going on. So now I'll go in with a tri-field meter, a digital recorder, and I have like a little point of view uh, night vision camera. Right. That's about all I take anymore, but... Axe Murder House, 100% EVPs. I feel sorry for people that don't come with any type of recording device at all. So yeah. they're, they're missing a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, as you know, Johnny, Anthony and I are going to be there this Sunday. So is there any bit of advice that you can give us or maybe some inside info on where to spend more of our time when we're in the house? Oh, definitely, and I'll probably be the one to check you guys in. I'll make sure that the okay. you know, seat. I'm looking forward to it, but upstairs for me seems to be kind of where it all centers and you know, push, push, push. Sometimes it's on right when you walk in the door. Other times, you know, it takes some doing, but, yeah, I'm confident you guys will walk away with EVPs at the very least, yeah. There's all these notes that overnighters leave, and I, I love reading them. A lot. There's been a few people that say, "Oh, not much happened. Heard voices, got some EVPs, a door opened and slammed, but other than that, nothing." Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want the house to lift up and spin around and slam back down? <laughs> you know, you exactly. Catch one EVP, consider yourself lucky in any haunted place. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I was and joking also, around earlier. I I was joking around earlier, and I said, "What if we go there and nothing happens?" <laughs> oh, jeez, yeah, that was. <laughs> I'll, give it a good pep. <laughs> I'll give it a good pep talk that morning. <laughs> Thank you. 
And, and this place will mess with your head a lot, too. I mean, you know, I don't know how many people I've heard. Uh, before I came, I was having dreams of it, and after they come, they're obsessed with it. And while you're in there, it'll affect your mood. You'll feel like bawling one second, and then you'll feel rage, like you want to, you know, just kill everybody in there the next second. And I mean, it's it'll, it'll mess with your head, definitely. Okay. Okay. Well, we're ready. Um, you know, um, would we uh, be able to access the basement while we're there? Oh, yeah. Yep. Barn, basement, house, every inch of that place is yours. Okay. And is there any um is there any activity that's been uh reported in the in the cellar? Uh probably one of the best shadow figures I've ever seen in my life was caught down there. And it was caught by two uh filmmakers from New York. They were doing like a, a screenplay. I don't know if they're doing what on, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> they weren't into ghosts or anything like that. They did like Broadway shows and stuff, and I thought, oh, okay, it's kind of weird, but they were here for two nights, and the one guy was just filming all the house for inspiration. He opened up the cellar door, and he goes to walk down, and right then, full-on shadow figure, right in the camera view, from left to right. I mean, slow enough that you can make every detail out, and he ran out of that basement, like, screaming, and I begged him and begged him for years to send me a copy of it, but I, he hasn't yet. Um, hmm. Another time, uh, one of the members of Calhoun County Paranormal was on their way out of the basement, and as he lifted the door, I, it's almost like somebody jumped on it and it slammed back down, almost pinched his finger, and he instantly busted the door wide open, thinking some kid was messed around and nobody anywhere. So it's definitely got some activity. Okay, okay. Well, we're certainly looking forward to it. And you know what, Johnny, it has been a real pleasure to speak with you tonight. I know our listeners have enjoyed it. We can't wait to get there on Sunday, and we're looking forward to to actually meeting you, uh, you know, face-to-face for the first time. So I do want to thank you, Johnny, for coming on, sharing your history, your amazing experiences, and most of all, your incredibly haunted location, the Villisca Axe Murder House. Now, for everyone out there, for more information, and if you want to book an investigation, please go to www.villiscaiowa.com. And also check out www.everydayparanormal.com for more information about Johnny Hauser and this group. Johnny, thank you so much. We're going to see you on Sunday. Yeah, thanks for having me, and I look forward to meeting you guys here in a couple days. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, we're excited, Johnny. Thank thank you so much for coming on, and uh, and have a great weekend. You too, and I'll... I'll start getting the house revved up tomorrow morning for you guys. <laughs> oh, oh thank you so much. <laughs> We're going to have Lucy screaming. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> oh, good. 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 <laughs> Love you too, Johnny. Thank, thank, <laughs> thank you, Johnny. We'll, we'll see you on Sunday. Take care now. You too. Good night. All right. Bye-bye. Well. Okay. <laughs> Have me screaming, huh? <laughs> uh huh. Hey, if you leave screaming, uh, I'm still staying. So. No, 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 no. As, as he said, as, as Johnny posted one night, I'm wearing my big girl pants. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care where Actually, the diapers and the pens. <laughs> <laughs> wear the diapers and the pens. I don't care. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Anthony, um, I reached out to Cheryl Patton this week about uh, Cheryl Patton, if you remember everybody. She is an excellent numerologist, and when we had her on the uh, show before, she had mentioned that, you know, she could uh, take addresses and kind of give like a, uh, you know, get a feeling of what the house is like. So do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. You you had uh, actually reached out to Cheryl and like you said before, we did have her on the show, and we mentioned that we were going to Villisca, and we asked her if she would be kind enough to um, give a little reading about the uh, the numbers 
the address of the home of the Villiscax Murder House. And um, you communicated with her this week. And um, for everybody who uh, is unaware of the address, I mean, it's posted all over the place. Um, the address is 508 East 2nd Street. So we provided that to Cheryl. And she took the numbers 508 and the 2, I believe, also. I think she took the 2. Um, mm -hmm. And did a little numerology report for us just to give us a sense of what the numbers meant to the home, what, what, the, what the attraction was um, with the numbers uh, and with the land and the, the location itself. So, Lucy, why don't, you, uh, why don't you share with everybody what she had mentioned and told us. Okay. Well, Cheryl took the address, which is 508 East Second Street, and you know basically what Cheryl said is that um, I'm going to quote her. You know, axe murder. So we're talking about some real negative vibrations in this house, aren't we? And it's interesting because she usually works on the positive side of numbers. Well, here we were going to look at the negative side of numbers, and what is it about the address that would bring out a negative event? So she looked at the number 508. And it adds up to the number 13. 13 breaks down to 4. And the number 4 in numerology can be very domineering. Um, for once, its own way. 4 can be very argumentative. And on the debate team, that's great. But in a relationship, they can be a real ass. And she said that she's talking about the epitome of the negative number 4. A number four can overanalyze. It can make mountains out of mold hills. Um, number four, a, a number four, it, it says, it, it, it says, my home is my castle. A four would not be real open to sharing their house with anyone else. Like the number nine, they can be very me, me, me. Now she talks about the vibration, and the vibration would be. This is my place. What are you doing here? Now, on the positive side, number fours are educators, teachers, and they know a little bit about everything. Stability, security, business number, home-based business. Um, she says, think of it as Donald Trump, who has a life path of number four. He didn't get where he's at by being a really nice guy. So, Anthony, when I, I mentioned this earlier this week, when... I was looking at this, you know, all of this thing with the number four. Um, you know, this is my house. What are you doing there? That really kind of made sense to me with this negative entity that's in there. And just watching the shows and watching, you know, listening to other people's investigations and stuff, the feeling that I'm getting from this, this entity, you know, whether it be the killer or whoever this, this entity is, it certainly does fit into that where it's like, this is my house. And that's kind of the feeling that I'm getting. You know, it's almost like I'm so excited to get to this house, but I'm also very cautious because I'm getting a feeling that whatever is there um, isn't too crazy about it, people coming in and investigating. I don't know. Do, 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 I don't know if that struck you the same way or, or did it? Well, <clears throat> well I, I mean, you have to take into consideration um, – the haunted location itself and and you know every haunted location whenever there are spirits the the feelings are pretty much the same you know they feel as though it's their place and you know some in some cases rightfully so either they live there or they work there um or it's their place that they used to call home and so um naturally the the feeling is when a spirit doesn't move on uh, or, you know, is not at rest and they don't move on, they stay in the location. Uh, it, it's for, it could be for many, many, many reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, for one thing, it's sort of taking control of the house or control of the location itself. So um, the domineering factor that she mentioned about the number four, um, I can see a relation to it, but it kind of goes along with most haunted locations itself. Um, I know that, uh, you know, numerology, um, I'm not too familiar with it, and I, I'm not brushed up on um, the history and the validity of it, um, not to say anything about Cheryl, but um, I, I think her assessment is correct. I think what would have been even better, um, Lucy, to be honest, totally honest, 
is if um, we didn't mention on we didn't mention it on the air with her that we were going to talk about this, and we just gave her the numbers alone just to see if she would have given us the same thing without having that knowledge that it was a you know quote unquote evil home, um, just to see. But I'm sure she probably would have come because numbers don't lie, you know. The address didn't change. But one of the things that um, I actually wanted to bring up, Lucy, and I. I Picked this out when we were doing research on the Velisca House, that um, the location and the address, 508 East Second Street, actually has a relation to another haunted location. Um, do you remember I mentioned this to you earlier in the week, Lucy? Mm-hmm. Yes, you did. Okay, and again, I, forgive me because I don't have the whole story, and I'm just going to mention it. Maybe you guys can go out there and Google it. But um, I found out that 508 East 2nd Street, which is the address to Villisca, is the same address to the Sally House. Um, and forgive me, I don't know what state the Sally House is in. Maybe you guys in chat know. Um, but the Sally House is a pretty um, infamous haunted location. And the addresses are the same. I believe the stories of uh, of the spirits and the... I believe that the murders are eerily similar in that fact, and so, um, and so. Um, House is in Kansas, Atchison, Kansas. Okay, so um, you know it. That kind of intrigues me. You know how that happens. How the, those two are the same, and uh, they have the numbers. So. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I really thank Cheryl for putting this together for us and letting us know this little piece of information as it uh, correlates to numerology, but I'm not sure. You know, again, numbers and, and things like that can be for any kind of location. That's just my thought. Mm-hmm. Well, I found that interesting, and, and like I said, the Sally House, I mean, that's another one that I'm just learning a little bit about, and I think it's some place that we need to put on the list of places that we want to go. But I wanted to ask you, now that now that we've talked to Johnny and now that we're ready to get going, just what are you expecting out of this investigation? I, I don't like to, and you know me, Lucy, I'm very... I know. Um, I, I'm very easygoing. I don't like to um, create expectations for things of the unknown. Or, or or of the unknown, you know, I hate to do that for myself because I don't like to get hopes up and then, you know, brought down. I like to go into a location not expecting anything at all and hoping that maybe I can communicate with, with the spirits or I can see the spirits or entities that are there. Um, I, I, I would like, and this may sound funny, but just for the sake of all the traveling that we're going to be doing uh, in the next Actually, in about eight hours, I'm going to be traveling. Um, you know, with, with all those hours logged in and everything, that, that we do find something. But if it doesn't, you know what? The, just going there and being in that home for how long are we going to be in that home for? Twelve hours. Twelve hours. And, you know, just being wow. in there for twelve hours. You know, not sleeping because I know I'm not going to sleep in that home. Um, <laughs> Just to just to be there and experience it would be worth the trip anyway. And if there's anything that comes from it, either it be a communication, an EVP, a video, whatever it is, um, would be sort of the cherry on the top. But just going there for me, I think, is – it's always been on my list. I have, for years now, have talked about this with so many people, with you, with my friends. Um, I have seen um, – uh, scariest places on earth many many years ago that had this uh, uh, at the episode about Velisca and then of course you know the ghost adventures and ghost labs but um, it's always been in my mind that I want to go here I want to go here and I'm finally actually getting the opportunity to go thanks to you Lucy um, mm-hmm. so you know again like I said it's, it's just going there is just going to be the um, the cake for me but uh, what about you do you have any expectations well, first off, I'm so, so happy when it came to thinking about what do I get you for your birthday. This was the first thing that popped into my head, and it was like this, I had to do this. But you know what, after after all the research and after talking to everybody like that, I'm actually kind of excited about going to the town, you know, the whole, the whole right. thing, not just the house. I kind of want to really check out the town. I want to check out the museum. And, you know, after what 
after what both Johnny and in our research about the the Native American thing, you know me. Uh, if it's got a Native American connection to it, I'm I'm in, you know. And just the whole thought of just what he was saying about, you know, um, well, the research pointed out that it was a place that they felt when they first got there that nothing would grow there. And this is what the tribes had looked at. And when you got a place that things don't grow, crops don't grow, um, they feel that the earth is, is negative, that there's a bad thing there. Um, I'm really curious about that. I'm really curious to find what I'm going to feel. So it's not just the house. I mean, it's the whole thing. I want to I wanna experience coming into the town. I want to I wanna see. I, I just can't imagine living in, well, first off, I can't imagine living in a small town. But the second part, I just can't imagine living so close by to something like this. You know, I... I I know that people have experiences there, and I've got all these theories in my head, and I, I just want to experience this. So I am just, like, so super excited. I, I, I really am. I, you know, listening to everything and, of course, listening to Johnny, I mean, I just can't imagine being able to access this house almost any time. That, that has got to be fantastic. Pa Pamela in chat just mentioned, I just read um, that, she, that she mentioned we should go visit the grave sites, which we have actually um, planned to do that. We want to go to mm -hmm. the grave sites and, and pay our respects to uh, to them. And I think maybe, Lucy, I think we're going to do that first before we go mm -hmm. to the home. Um, okay. And maybe, you know, maybe pick up some flowers and, um, yeah. you know, leave them at, at the, the grave site and the gravestones. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm also interested in what, feelings or what what transpires when I go with you, since you do have a Native American background, you are Cherokee, um, you know, how that is going to affect you or affect me or affect our investigation when we go to Villisca. i um, curious to see what will transpire when that happens. I, I've never heard of another paranormal group that has had a, uh, a Native American member in it go to the home <clears throat> and investigate, um, to my knowledge, maybe there was, but to my knowledge and from what I've seen online, I haven't seen any groups um, that do have Native American um, members in it. So maybe we're the first, but I, I think it will be really cool just to see if there is that connection. You know, we had that when we went to Bobby Mackey's. You did that special um, mm -hmm. laying of tobacco down in there, and uh, that place had uh, Native American burial grounds on it. In uh, in Kentucky, and so it will be sort of interesting. Are you are you thinking of doing anything like that here at Velisca? I you know I thought about it, but Mackey's is a little bit different because it's a burial ground where you take your loved ones and and family members. Now this is different. This is mm -hmm. an area that the tribes felt was negative, and part of they buried you know, the people that were mentally unstable. They buried the people that were negative there. So you've got negative earth, but you've also got negative entities that have been buried there. And like Johnny said, they buried them face down in a shallow grave. And the reasoning right. behind that is that so that their spirits are unable to rest. So, you know, I'll bring the cigarettes and I think... I, you know, as, as always, I always ask for, if I know that there's a Native American uh, connection, I always ask the spirits, the elders, my, you know, my, my ancestors, you know, just to watch over and to facilitate communication. I think this might be a little bit different because I think the spirits that are there are not aware. I, I think they're, they're, you know, they may be, the feeling I'm getting is that the way they were in life they may be like this on the other side. So whether or not they're going to react to me, whether or not they're even going to speak to me, I don't know. I mean, I won't know till I get there, but I'm going to bring the cigarettes anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And if I feel like it's going to work, then we'll try it. But if it doesn't, then I'm going to – I think, well, we'll, well, we won't do it. I just have to feel how I get there, you know, how the feeling is. But – I'm telling you, I just cannot wait. Um, I, I do, you know, like, I've done as much research as I can on the tribes. Um, 
basically, you know, our beliefs are, are pretty much the same from tribe to tribe. We all believe the same thing. So, again, this is, I think this is slightly different than when we went to Mackey's. I mean, when we went to Mackey's and I, and I left the cigarettes as offerings, I'm telling you, I had such a peaceful feeling in there. I mean, I think I'm the only person that that I know of that said that I really enjoyed being in in Mackey's, that it felt peaceful to me, that it felt like it felt like a good place. And I know not everybody gets that that feeling. Now here we've got a place where we've got you know negative the bad people and you've got like all these these investigators coming in and they're they're stirring up things i got a feeling it, it it's active for a reason because these people these spirits that are there i think they're at unrest to begin with and the more traffic that's coming in like johnny mentioned you know everybody's bringing stuff there and there's it, there's other things opening up um I'm really curious to see what kind of EVPs we can get. I mean, when he mentioned that one in French, wow, that's that's amazing. But then again, how does how do you get an EVP in French in the middle of of Iowa? You know, what is it possible that a portal is opened? I mean, you know, all these thoughts are going through my head, and I'm not going to know what's what's what until I actually get there. And this is really weird because, like, some of the other places that we've gone, I've always been able to get a feeling ahead of time. I'm not feeling anything right now. I mean, and that's really unusual. So I'm really curious. I mean, I can't wait to get there, but I think it's not just the house. I think it's the whole town. So we'll see. I can't wait. Well, as you said that you haven't gotten any feelings, when you usually do, um, it's kind of weird because I have been. I didn't tell you this, but I have been um, for the last five days very weird. I, I, won't, I won't go into it. Maybe I'll, I'll mm-hmm. bring it up and talk about it when we investigate on Sunday. But um, um, that was different for me. I never usually have that. I've had very weird dreams lately and um, I'm starting to hear noises. I hope uh, nobody that I know is listening to this. But uh, I, I'm hearing noises in my house. But um, anyway, um uh, this, this is just sort of leading me into a uh, sort of preempt to what we're going to do on Sunday. And Sunday we're going to have a live broadcast. We're hoping that we can do a live broadcast. I know some other radio shows um, and Ustream channels have broadcasted from the home to do a live investigation from there. And uh, we're hoping to do that this time. We did it once before in Prospect Place, and it was phenomenal, I thought. Um, I thought it was just a great thing. We did have trouble in Prospect getting the laptop to work and to connect to the Wi-Fi, but um, we have a second ability to use our uh, smartphones. Um, and hopefully that will work in the home if the laptop doesn't. So we're going to try our damnedest to get this to work so that we can broadcast live. And what we want to do and what we've been mentioning all along on our Facebook page is to have you guys out there, you guys in your home right now, if you're you know sitting on the couch watching TV while listening to us, um, we want to bring you to the home, but you know without you having to travel. And um, we'd love for you guys to call in and we will put your voice on speaker, and uh, you'll have a chance to, you know, ask a question or communicate with the home in whatever way you want. We just ask that you don't sort of, you know, do heavy, heavy provoking, cursing, or anything like that. I try not to do that. Um, I will provoke. I will push, you know, uh, to to a limit, but I won't go. I won't get into that factor. So we just ask that you don't do that. And hopefully, maybe your questions will then help um, capture some EVPs. Now, also too, the the show is going to be broadcasted live over the internet, and so it sort of acts like a digital audio recorder. Um, actually, real time audio recorder. So you may be able to actually hear voices that we won't be able to hear at the time because it's coming through digitally over um, over the phones or over the Internet. So um, we'd love for you guys, if you guys will be listening on Sunday, to let us know and, uh, you know, let us know if you hear anything um, or if you even feel anything, you know, just let us know about those things. Now, also, too, um, Lucy, I want to announce to everybody that um, when we go to locations and we go on investigations, we go how many times a year? Maybe four or five times, I think? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
and each each time we like to go, we 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 don't sort of generalize our investigation. Each location that we go to, obviously we do our research, but we also gear what we're going to ask, obviously, um, to each location and make it more personal, bring up names and such, but we also like to bring trigger objects. And um, and so the, at Prospect Place, Prospect Place, we actually brought a doll because there was a supposed girl being haunt, uh, haunting the location there. And so this time, obviously, there is children there. There's a six children and, and two adult spirits, and <clears throat> possibly the murderer is still there. So um, we've also been able to gather up some toys and balls and, and lighted stuff that uh, we're hoping to um, play with the children there and hopefully get them to be active. Obviously, a lot of folks do that. Um, but one thing, Lucy, I want to bring up that I'm bringing that uh, may be a little bit different is the handcuffs. <laughs> and no, we're not doing anything sexual in the home. Um, <laughs> I want to bring I want to bring handcuffs. You will hear me scream then. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Okay. Um, I do want to bring handcuffs to the home, and I want to pretend as though I'm there to come and arrest the murderer. And I'm hoping maybe that will be um, something that triggers this person um, to come out, hopefully getting a name. Um, I really want to get who is there. I really want to get the name. I really want to get a, a – a, um, uh, I can't think of it right now. Oh, my God. You know, a, a confession. I really want to get a mm -hmm. confession from, from this person, you know. And so maybe bringing in the um, the handcuffs and, and putting that fear into whatever that evil thing is there, um, maybe it'll help. I don't know. Maybe it won't. But it'll be a fun aspect to bring in, so you guys will be privy to that once you listen in. And also, too, what we like to do is play music from the time period. And we've gathered some audio clips from the uh, 1900s all the way to 1910 of some of the pop, more popular music that was heard during that time. And we're hoping that maybe makes them more comfortable and makes us more welcomed in the home, that they would open up to us. And we'd like to do that. We've done that in other locations, too, and it's helped out a lot, tremendously, actually. Mm -hmm. And so we're hoping to do that again this time, and maybe we will start off with that, open them up, and uh, hopefully that they'll welcome us in and then be able to communicate that way. So we're going to try everything that we could possibly do. And if you guys uh, have either investigated at that location or if you've used techniques that you think may help us in this home, go to our Facebook page uh, at Paranormal Review Radio and uh, drop us a post or comment and let us know what sort of techniques that you've found that may have worked that uh, – may help us. Who knows? We may have done it before, um, or we may not have, but, um, you know, because there's a lot of groups out there that do some really unique creative stuff, and so it may be uh, cool to see what other people do, and we may try that um, on air when we broadcast from Villisca Axe. Well, you know, one thing that I did want to mention, too, like, you know, we're going to go to the cemetery, and I want to bring flowers, but I also want to bring flowers to the house. I mean, not to focus just on the negative. I mean, if Mrs. Moore is still there, you know, we're always very respectful when we go into places. I want to, you know, I, I want to establish a connection with her and just let her know, you know, thank her for letting us into the, into her home. I want to bring some fresh flowers for her. You know, of course, I know we have to t take them out when we leave, but I'd like to maybe, you know, smooth the way. I, I would love for her to understand that we're not there, you know, to destroy her home. I mean, it's still her home, and if she's still there, I would like to connect with her. Um, you know, the children, of course, will bring the toys, but for some reason I just really have this really feeling, this need that I want to bring flowers to the house. I really do. I think there's so much focus on the negative. I'd like to see what happens when we kind of touch on the other stuff. You know, we're talking about this was a home, uh, you know, a mother, a father, and their children. I mean, it basically, it was a home for them. Um, aside from the negative that happened, I'm sure whatever there is, negative is there. 
and I'm sure it is very strong. But I still have this feeling, I mean, I really want to connect with Mrs. Moore. So we'll see. You know, I, I know they were church-going people, um, you know, maybe playing some church hymns or something might help to connect. Um, right. It, this, you know, there's so many things that I think people don't look at. I mean, I think everything focuses on the negative. I would like to connect with the other things that are in there. It's just a thought. Yeah, no, and and obviously we are going to be that way with, you know, the Moore family and the two Stillinger girls, but um, with that, uh, you know, that evil bastard that's in there, uh, I'm not going to be kind. I I I want to find out, you know, what he did, uh, who it is, and why he's still there. And if he's still there and he's still tormenting them, then, um, you know, there's going to be words that are going to be said. Um, so it's going to be an interesting night. It's going to be a fun night. Um, this is actually going to be a first for me and maybe for you, Lucy, that we're actually investigating a haunted house. Um, mm-hmm. A home. We've always done insane asylums and um, prison cells. I've done hotels. Um, but this is going to be the first haunted house that I've ever done and I think you've ever done. So to be pretty interesting, pretty pretty, pretty fun to, to be in a confined space like that. We've always been in such large institutions or locations. Um, to be in such a small area like this um, – is uh, is going to be um, it's going to be very different, but I think it's going to be even more fun for us. I can't wait. I so I mean, talking about it, I'm more excited. And like I says, um, I really want to find out about what you've been feeling now. That it it's very interesting because usually I'm the one that feels things, and for you to be feeling things, I think maybe your connection might be a little bit stronger to this house than mine. Well, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure if it's with the that house itself or or what but uh um who knows you know i'm not going to make any judgment judgments or anything like that but um that's it um, somebody in the chat room Lucy, mentioned bubbles bring bubbles yeah somebody mentioned um bringing bubbles mateo saying play-doh <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what no, we're supposed you, to do with Play-Doh. <laughs> well, I don't know, you know, Lego blocks. <laughs> we can yeah. sit there and build Lego blocks. I'm I just going to play with to toys all night. I don't care. <laughs> you know what? And I was I was just joking around the other night, but I was saying, you know, I wonder what would happen if somebody brought an Xbox and set it up and we just play Call of Duty <laughs> all night. <laughs> I think hey, that would be know. a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you want to move on to the Paranormal Review uh, Fan of the Week? Yeah, in seven hours I have to catch a flight, so yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay, so um, the Paranormal Review, re- the Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week this week is from Colorado Springs, Colorado, but she is originally from Chicago, Illinois. This week's Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week is Nicole Yuring. Nicole has been there always from the beginning. She posts, she she um, she likes the Twilight Saga, the Hangover. She's a gamer. She likes Battle, uh, Battlefield 3. And, of course, she likes Paranormal Review Radio. Congratulations, Nicole, and thank you so much for being a fan. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, I think, you know, we can all agree that this location is definitely different from any others that is open to investigators. You know, what happened in this house really did horrify, and it sickened the country at the time. That activity that continues today frightens and intrigues both paranormal investigators and students of crimes and human behavior. So now what? Well... As we mentioned earlier, Anthony and I are heading out tomorrow for our own investigation of the house. What are we going to find? Again, we want you to join us over the airwaves as we enter the Valeska Axe Murder House. 
you know, we're going to be broadcasting live from inside the house on Sunday night, and yes, we want you to call us live while we investigate. Your voice is going to be heard as we attempt to interact with the spirits that inhabit this location. So please, have your questions for the spirits ready. We're going to be on the air Sunday night at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. Again, the call-in number is 661-244-9831. Become part of our investigation without leaving the safety of your own home. We're hoping that we're going to connect and collect evidence and possibly find some answers to many of the questions that surround this tragedy. This, I think, is going to be our most intense trip so far, and we want you to be a part of it. Now, next Friday night, August 24th, of course, we're going to have our evidence review show, so make sure you save that date. Um, I do want to thank... Johnny Hauser for joining us tonight. You know, he's truly a really great guy, and we've been honored to have him on the show. Thank you to all of you for listening. You know, you guys really are the best fans ever. This investigation is for you just as much as it is for us. Finally, Anthony, thank you for being my partner in all of this. You know, I'm so ready for this adventure. I would not want to go there with anyone else. So until Sunday night, dear friends, good night. Spooky dreams. Good night, everybody. Paranormal Review Radio. Review Radio.